Chapter One, Part One of History of Egypt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rick Vina. History of Egypt by F. C. H. Wendell. Chapter One, Part One. Introductory. Section One. The Ancient Geography of Egypt. Egypt lies in the northeastern corner of Africa, between the twenty fourth and the thirty second degrees of north latitude. It is bounded on the east by Asia and the Red Sea, on the south by a line drawn east and west through Aswan on the first cataract, on the west by the desert of Sahara, and on the north by the Mediterranean Sea. This tract of country is five hundred and twenty miles long, and on an average one hundred and sixty miles wide. The area of the entire country is about 100,000 square miles, or about two and a half times that of Ohio. But the whole of this country is not cultivable. By far the larger part is desert, on the west a low, arid, sandy plain, on the east an arid mountain region. Only the immediate valley of the Nile is arable soil and this is a very narrow strip, which between Aswan and the Delta never exceeds fifteen miles in width, and at places is only two miles wide. In the Delta there is a far wider stretch of cultivable land, owing to the fact that the Nile here divides into numerous branches, but even here all the land is not available for cultivation owing to numerous great swamps and large lakes. In antiquity, the greater part of the delta was swamp and meadowland, and its chief value lay in the fact that it was a good grazing country, and that its swamps and lakes made fine hunting grounds, abounding as they did in all sorts of aquatic birds. The lakes were full of fish, so that fishing was added to grazing and hunting, and thus the country possessed considerable resources even before agriculture became profitable. It is well known that Egypt owes this strip of good land to the Nile. This remarkable river, which rises in the Nyanza lakes in tropical Africa, and has several branches which come from the Ethiopic highlands, is annually swollen by the rains which prevail in the tropics during the rainy season. Already in June the river begins to rise and continues to swell until about September 15th, when it reaches the high-water mark. It then remains stationary until late in October, when it begins to fall, and by January the river is again at its old level. So important was this rise of the Nile to the entire population that the ancient Egyptians made the day on which the river attained its highest level, September 15th, their New Year's Day, called in Egyptian Op Rampet. The inundation brought coolness, humidity, and fertility. The river brought down from the Ethiopian highlands vast masses of mud which it deposited on the egyptian soil when it inundated the land and which remained there when the water receded thus an alluvial soil of great depth and richness was produced the full benefits of the inundation could not however be gained without hard work on the part of the dwellers in the nile valley as rain was in antiquity almost entirely wanting in Egypt, 
a carefully arranged system of irrigation was necessary to convey the much-needed moisture to the more remote fields. The digging of canals from the river and building of reservoirs were not easy work, and moreover the overflow had to be carefully regulated in accordance with the character of the various fields should the full results be obtained. Thus, we see that the Egyptian farmer could not sit with folded arms and let his generous river do the work for him. He had to be up and doing from early morning till late at night to reap the full benefits obtainable from his wonderful stream. Before we touch the old geographical division of the country, we may well say a few words of the character of the rocky highlands that fringe the Nile Valley. At the first cataract, the river breaks through a vast granite barrier that here crosses the Nubian sandstone deposit. At this place, the Egyptians had established, already in the times of King Chufu, about 2800 B.C., great quarries from which they took their supply of granite. In the same neighborhood, basalt, too, was quarried about this time. The Nubian sandstone then continues as far north as Silsile, where the Egyptians early worked sandstone quarries. The character of the hills now changes. A little to the north of Silsile, the sandstone giving place to a tertiary pneumolytic limestone, which formation continues on both sides of the Nile, on the west to the Mediterranean, on the east to Memphis, whence it strikes off to the northeast. These rocky hills seldom reach and never exceed the moderate height of six hundred to eight hundred feet. The character of the mountain region between the Nile and the Red Sea is, however, vastly different. Here we meet with grand and imposing mountain scenery, the bold, many-colored mountain peaks often reaching a height of six thousand feet. These mountains consist of crystalline rock, granite, gneiss, porphyry, diorite, and others. Several valleys lead from the Nile into this region. The most important of these is the Wadi Hamamat, the Rohanu of the ancient Egyptians, a valley extending from Kene on the Nile to Kosur on the Red Sea. This valley was used in antiquity as a trade route between the Nile Valley and the sea, the point of departure being, in olden times, the city of Kebti, the Koptos of the Greeks, the modern Kuft, and the Red Sea port being some place near the modern Koser. For a time, it was at the extremity of the Wadi Gasus, north of Koser. This valley, had in antiquity a further significance. Midway between the Nile and the Red Sea, the Egyptians worked in very early times diorite quarries of considerable extent. So much for the general character of the land. We now turn to a consideration of the ancient geography. The Egyptian official name of the state was Taui, both lands, that is, both North and South Egypt. The name Kemet, the Black Land, was also often used, though not in state documents. From this name was derived the Coptic name of the country, Keme in Sahidic, Shemi in Boheric, from which the latter form was derived the Hebrew Ham, the country was divided into two parts, the south, known in Egyptian as Res, or Kemat, the south, and as Pa-Ta-Res, the south land, 
which latter name gave rise to the Hebrew Patros. The reader's note, name in Greek letters, of the Septuaginta and the North, designated in Egyptian as Meta, the North, and Pata Mera. The South included all the land from Aswan to Memphis, the North all of the Delta. Why this division was made we shall see in Section 3. Each of these countries was divided into a number of small districts, which we are accustomed to designate as gnomes, generally given as forty-two in number, twenty-two in upper and twenty in lower Egypt. I here enumerate the twenty-two upper Egyptian and the principal lower Egyptian gnomes, going from south to north, and stating as briefly as possible what interest attaches to each. 1. The southernmost gnome, Ta Chont, extended from Aswan to Silsile. Its chief town was the city of Abu, Greek Elephantine, situated on an island in the Nile. Opposite this city, on the river bank, lay the town of Swen, where the old granite quarries were situated. Swen became in Greek Syen and from this, by prefixing the article, the Arabs made az -suan. On the northern boundary of the Nome lay the sandstone quarries of Silsile. The deity worshipped in this Nome was the god Knum. 2. The second Nome was called tes -hor. Its capital and religious center was the famous old town of Debot, the modern Edfu, where the well-preserved ruins of the temple erected by the Ptolemies to the local divinity Hor Debeti, a form of the god Horus, still excite the admiration of the beholder. 3. The third gnome, Ten, with the capital Nekebet, the modern Elkab, Greek Eletheia, the home of the old tutelar deity of Upper Egypt, the goddess Nekebet, had for local deity the god Chenum. Two other cities of importance were situated in this nome, Anit, the modern Esne, where there stands a fairly preserved temple built in Ptolemaic times, and the city of On, called On of the god Mont, in contradistinction to on Heliopolis, the city of Ra in Lower Egypt. It is the Greek Hermonthus, an Arabic Erment. 4. Now follows the fourth nome, Oeset, the capital of which was the famous city of Oeset, commonly known by its Greek name Thebes. Its chief divinity was Amon. Mentu was worshipped in the southern portion. 5. Horui, the capital of which was the city of Kebti, situated on the Nile at the entrance to the Wadi Hamamat, of which we have spoken above. The local divinity was the god Min. 6. Eati had chiefly religious importance. Its capital, ta ent ter er modern Dendera, Greek Tentiris, was the home of the great goddess Hathor. Her temple, built by the Ptolemies, is fairly preserved. 7. The Nome Sechem, the capital of which was Hat, Diospolis Parva, had the same local divinity, Hathor. 8. Abt was one of the most important gnomes. Its capital was Abdu, Abydos, the seat of the Osiris religion, an alleged burial place of the god. 9. The ninth gnome, Min, with the capital Per-Min, 
house of men greek panopolis had but little importance ten this nome called oatjet the capital of which was debu aphroditopolis worshipped the goddess hathor the district neterui with the capital duca and the god horus formed part of it eleven the eleventh nome set the capital of which was shashotep hypsale was devoted to the god shnam twelve duefu had as capital the town of nut and bek and worshipped the god horus the chief importance of this nome lay in its valuable alabaster quarries which were worked in very early times near the ancient city of hatnub the modern ebnub thirteen the nome atefchont the capital of which was the old city of sayut sayut a town that in the middle empire twenty one hundred to nineteen hundred b c was of considerable importance owing to the influential and powerful position occupied by its nomarchoi it was the chief seat of the cult of the jackal-headed god of the dead anubis fourteen atefpe was unimportant its capital was kesi Kuse, and its deity hathor fifteen the nome of owen had for capital the city of chamunu greek hermopolis modern eshmunen which derived its name from the fact that it was the seat of the eight gods of the elements so called the chief divinity of the nome was the god of wisdom thought sixteen memahet was of great importance in the times of the middle empire owing to its influential and mighty nomarchoi whose tombs were discovered at bani hasan to these tombs which are hewn into the living rock and the walls of which are covered with important representations and inscriptions we owe much of what we know of this period the capital was hebenu and the local divinity horus seventeen the capital of the nome anbu was kasa sinonpolis its god was anubis eighteen sapet the capital of which was hotbenu alabastronpolis one of the seats of the anubis cult was important for its alabaster quarries which were opened in early times nineteen Oab, the capital of which was the city of Permachet, Axerhinchos, was the only nome where Set was worshipped. From this nome led the roads to the oases of the eastern Sahara. 20. This nome bore the name Atefchont. Its capital was Chenensuten, Heracleopolis Magna a city of great importance in the religion of egypt as the god ra was supposed to have made his first appearance here the local divinity of the nome was horsha a form of horus twenty one atefpe had for capital the city of samenhor and for local deity the god chnum the western part was known as tashe lakeland the modern name of the region being fayum which is derived from the ancient word payum the sea through the medium of the bohiric dialect of the coptic in which it became fayum here was situated the great reservoir built by amenhotep the third twenty two the northernmost nome of upper egypt was known as Ma-Ten. Its capital was Tepa, 
and its local deity, the goddess Hathor. Of the twenty lower Egyptian gnomes, I shall enumerate only the principal ones. 1. Anbu Hecht, the gnome of Menefer, Memphis, the city of Ta. 4. Sepires, the gnome of Cheka, Canopus, where Amun Ra was worshipped. 5. Sepi Emhet, the gnome of Sa, Sais, where the great goddess Neit was worshipped, the home of the Samitics. 9. Achi, the gnome of Per Usiri, Busiris, the city of Osiris. 12. Kacheb, the gnome of Jebnatur, Sabenithos, the home of the god Anher. 13. Hakad, the gnome of On, Heliopolis, the great seat of the Ra religion. 14. Chantabed, the gnome of Jan, Tanis, where Horus was worshipped. 16. Char, the gnome of Perbanebded, Mendes, the god of which was the sacred ram Banebded. 18. Amchent, the gnome of Perbastet, Bubastis, the city of the cat headed goddess Bastet. 19. Ampe, the name of Per Uatje, Buto, where Uatje, the tutelar deity of Lower Egypt, had her home. Section 2. The Sources of Egyptian History It is needful in a history of Egypt to give a brief summary of the sources from which our knowledge of the facts is derived. These sources are a. National, b. Asiatic, and c. Classical. a. National Sources before we give any account of the monuments and documents on which by far the greatest part of Egyptian history is based, it may be well to review rapidly the history of the decipherment of the hieroglyphics and to give a brief sketch of the Egyptian system of writing. Already in the Middle Ages, men like Athanasius Kircher attempted to decipher the mysterious picture writing of ancient Egypt, but their interpretations, proceeding from an utter misconception of the true nature of the hieroglyphics, were fantastical and utterly useless. The results attained by these men discredited the study of hieroglyphics, and scholars turned rather to Coptic, the liturgic language of the Christian Church of Egypt a descendant of the Egyptian tongue, and at the time still a living language. The results attained in this study were later on of great value to the decipherers of the ancient tongue. In August 1799, there was unearthed at Rosetta a block of black basalt bearing a decree of Ptolemy Epiphanes in Greek, hieroglyphics, and demotic, the celebrated Rosetta Stone. Immediately, scholars set to work at deciphering the inscription. Thomas Young, an English mathematician, and Francois Champollion, a French savant, working independently of one another, succeeded at about the same time in deciphering the royal names and the hieroglyphical part and, to the surprise of all, it was found that the writing was largely phonetic. Champollion's results were by far the more important, and when, ten years after his first great discovery, he died in 1832, he had already correctly given the contents of entire inscriptions and papyri, and had laid down the elements of a grammar. Ten years later, 
Richard Carl Lepsius, the great German Egyptologist, who died some years ago, carried further the work so ably begun by Champollion, and through him the final proof was given that the results so far attained were correct. He discovered in 1867 at Tanis a trilingual inscription, the so-called Decree of Canopus, the study of which document finally confirmed the results hitherto obtained from the study of the Egyptian texts. Thus, the stage of decipherment came to a close. Since then, able scholars in all parts of Europe have been adding to our knowledge of Egyptian matters. The Egyptian system of writing appears at first glance to be highly complicated, but it is in reality far simpler than it looks. It is a combination of the phonetic, alphabetic, and syllabic, and ideographic systems, to which is added a system of determinatives. The alphabet consists of twenty-two consonants. Vowels are, as in all other old Semitic languages, not written. The alphabetic and syllabic signs are by far the oldest, the most ancient texts being purely phonetic, containing neither ideograms nor determinatives. Owing to the fact that the vowels were not written, confusion early arose among words having the same consonants but different significations, and in all probability pronounced with different vowels. To obviate this difficulty, the Egyptians early invented a system of determinatives. A determinative is the picture of an object placed after the word signifying the object in question. Determinatives are either generic or specific. The generic determinative is the picture of some object which is characteristic of a group. Thus, after the names of animals, we frequently find the picture of a piece of skin. After abstract words and verbs, we find the picture of a papyrus roll. And after the names of foreign countries, we find the picture of a range of hills. The specific determinative is the picture of the object that the word denotes. Thus, after the word hetra, signifying horse, the picture of a horse was often placed. After the word abu, denoting panther, we often find a picture of that animal. After the word romet, man, we find a picture of a man, as also after the names of males. After the word suten, king, we find the picture of a king. After the word hemet, woman, the names of females and goddesses, we find the picture of a woman. And after the names of cities, we find the plan of a city. From these determinatives arose, in course of time, ideograms, or word pictures. Thus, the plan of a city, originally the determinative of the word nut, city, came with time to stand for the word itself, which is never written phonetically. The picture of a bee, originally the determinative of the word afet, honey, came with time to be used as the ideogram for that word. The figure of a man walking with a long staff, originally the determinative of the word sir, prince, later on was used as an ideogram. Many other examples could be given, but these will illustrate the general principle. In Ptolemaic times, the ideograms were greatly multiplied, many texts being written almost entirely in ideograms. It must, however, always be borne in mind that the writing was originally phonetic, and not 
ideographic. The writing, too, has a history of its own. In the oldest times, the writing was purely hieroglyphical. Hieroglyphics were written as early as 4000 B.C., if not earlier, and continued in use far into the times of the Roman emperors. These hieroglyphics were originally finely executed in every detail, and this remained the custom on all government monuments so long as hieroglyphics were used. But it was early found that the full hieroglyphics, while admirably adapted for inscriptions on stone, were too cumbersome for writing on papyrus or mummy bands, which were of linen. So an abridged or cursive form that we call linear hieroglyphics was invented. These linear hieroglyphics are merely the characteristic outlines of the full signs. They remained in use all through Egyptian history for religious texts written on papyrus and mummy bands. About 1700 B.C., a new method of writing came into vogue for profane writings. This new method, which still further abridged the hieroglyphics, is called hieratic. The older form of this hieratic still in some measure resembles the linear hieroglyphical writing from which it was derived. Some four hundred years this method seems to have been in use, when a new system came into being, which is also called hieratic, but differs materially from the older style from which it is abridged, in that it is far less cumbersome, omitting many of the details found in the older hieratic and being thus far more suitable for rapid writing. From this newer hieratic was derived the Phoenician alphabet, from which the Greek alphabet was derived. This form of the hieratic is thus the ancestor of our alphabet. This style of writing remained in fashion many hundred years as the cursive script used on papyrus, and sometimes even on mummy bands. The last stage in the development of Egyptian script was reached in the Demotic in the 5th century before the Christian era. This was a still further abridgment of the new hieratic, but it eliminated so many details that very many letters and syllabic signs that had been kept distinct in hieratic became one and the same sign, a fact that renders the reading of Demotic very difficult. The new system had, however, the advantage of being very rapid, and thus it quickly supplanted the hieratic. It remained in use up to the Christian times, when it was supplanted by the Coptic script which was modeled after the Greek. The reader must not, however, imagine that these changes were sudden. One led gradually to the other. Thus, the old, full hieroglyphics were abridged and the linear hieroglyphics. From these was developed the old hieratic, from this the new hieratic, and this, becoming gradually more and more cursive, led over to the Demotic. We now pass to a consideration of the Egyptian sources from which our knowledge of the facts of Egyptian history is derived. The texts which are of primary importance are the lists of kings compiled in antiquity. The most important of these is the so-called Turin Papyrus of Kings, which gives a list of Egyptian kings from the earliest times to the times of the 16th dynasty, about 1700 B.C., including the earlier kings of this dynasty, 
in which it was most probably written. This list is chronological. The duration of the reign of each king in years, months, and days being given after his name. Unfortunately, however, the papyrus is fragmentary, having been broken into one hundred and sixty-four small pieces on the way to Turin. Professor Seyfarth conferred a lasting benefit on historical science by arranging, numbering, and mounting these fragments, thus preserving this valuable document. The second list of importance is that discovered in the Temple of Osiris in Abydos. This list contains the names of seventy-five predecessors of Seti I, about 1320 B.C., arranged in chronological order. The third list was discovered in a private tomb dating from the time of Ramses II, 1300 to 1230 B.C. It enumerates 47 kings. The last important list is that found in Karnak, which enumerates 61 predecessors of Thutmosis III, 1480 to 1430. Besides these, a number of smaller and less important lists have been discovered. Next in importance to the lists stand the official inscriptions of the kings. The pharaohs were in the habit of inscribing on the walls of the temples they erected to the gods long accounts of their deeds. In order to be able to give a full account of their campaigns, the kings were accompanied by scribes, specially detailed to write down the history of these campaigns. Their accounts were then copied on the temple walls. Great paintings illustrating the principal events of a campaign covered the space not occupied by the inscriptions in that part of the temple allotted to the annals. These inscriptions were divided into two parts, the date, on which followed, as a rule, a laudatory hymn to the king, and the account of the campaign. These texts give a chronological account of the campaigns of the king, often going into the details of the march and of the various battles. Among the most interesting of these inscriptions is a copy of the Treaty of Peace and Alliance between Ramses II and Chedasar, King of the Cheda, which was originally engraved on a silver plate, and from this was copied on the outer wall of the Temple of Karnak, where it has been completely preserved. Of importance are further royal decrees, which are frequently found inscribed on stelae and temple walls. Reports of buildings erected by the kings, and of expeditions undertaken at their command, are not unfrequent. Several of the latter the reader will meet with later on. The most important report of all is that which Ramses III, about 1180 to 1148 B.C., gave of his reign, and which is preserved in the so-called Papyrus Harris I. It is a comprehensive account of Ramses's architectural enterprises, his expeditions, and his gifts to the temples. In addition, it gives a brief review of the state of Egypt immediately before the reign of the king's father, Setnecht. Lists of conquered nations are also of frequent occurrence, but often possess very little value. The most valuable of these lists is that of Thutmosis III, which gives the names of from 300 
to four hundred conquered nations and cities, lying mostly in Asia. Later lists, as those of Seti I and Ramses II, enumerating over a hundred countries, and that of Sheshong I, which gives an equal number, are frequently copied in part from the lists of Tutmosis III, and can be used only with the utmost caution. The oldest example of such a list is a stele of Usertesen I, which enumerates the Negro tribes conquered by him. Scarabae are seldom of historical value, though some belonging to the reign of Amenhotep III are important, namely those noticing his marriage with Queen T, and those giving accounts of his hunting exploits. Of great importance are the tombs of the nobles. These tombs had attached to them funereal chapels, the walls of which were covered with paintings and inscriptions, giving a brief biographical sketch of the individual buried in the tomb, enumerating his titles, his possessions, and all his exploits. These inscriptions are of great value. To them we owe all that we know of the Egyptian civilization, and often all the historical knowledge we possess of entire epochs. Confer the case of the Una inscription, page 42. End of chapter 1, part 1.